Hello team and welcome to tonight's Ask the Coach. Uh, yeah, tonight I'm going to crack straight into it. We've got a few questions here uh, that have been sent in. So I'm going to jump straight into it and, and go ahead and answer them. So just to give you an idea of what I'm going to be going over tonight. So it's more a lot of questions to do with uh, my previous career. So in the army, spent 16 years in the army. So I'm going to be going over a couple of things to do with that. So the questions I've got that have come in today. So the first one's from Anthony. So he wants to know the difference you've seen from both sides of being a full-timer and a part-time. So in the reserves. Yeah. For those that don't know, I started as a reservist back in 2005. I spent about a year or maybe a year and a half as a reserve initially. When I went to Puka, I knew I wanted to go full-time, but it just took a little bit of time to transition across. Yeah. Reserve for about a year and a half. And then my final posting, actually it was my final posting, but my second last posting that I was actually turning up for work and not on long service was back at that same reserve unit. So I spent another three years there, but on the full-time side of things. So I got to see both ends of it. And then I spent another six months to a year as a reserve once I transferred out of full-time as well. And now I'm not even a reservist. So I've got a lot of experience when it comes to reserve and full-time world, because not only have I been in both, but I've also been at a reserve unit and been both ends of the spectrum with being a reservist there and being full-time there. So good question, and I'll go over that one. He's also got, how did you land being a PDI and a VM? So I'll go over that one for you, and your top funny story from being an NCO. So I've got some good things that popped into my head. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty more there, but just a couple of things off the top of my head. And then we got a couple from Ben. These questions are, what was your favorite thing about the work you did? And also what did an average day consist of for you as a mechanic in the army. So let's crack in and get these questions answered for you. So the very first one, difference is seen from both sides of being a full-time. So the differences between a full-time and a part-timer that I saw with my experience. So they are vastly different in job roles and like you're still qualified the same. You're still in a sense, you just got to realize as a reserve, it, it is a part-time job. So you're there some of the time. It doesn't matter how much you turn up as a reservist. It's still not your full-time job that you do every day. You think everything, like you, even as a full-time, you don't know everything, but you think you're really in on it and you do a lot when you turn up a lot for reservists, but it's just not the same. And I've seen both ends of it. I started as a reserve and, went, and I was turning up, I was doing uh, what was called the RTAP scheme. So it's an apprenticeship scheme where you're, working in at the army reserves for months, for a month or so. And then you'll be out in civilian world, a lot like OJTs when you go full time and you're just back and forth. So I was in at the reserve unit working a lot. So I thought I knew what army was like, but I didn't. So when I went full time, that's when I found out what army was actually like. And you just live and breathe it every single day. So there's a different mindset towards it and you just, it's just different. Like when you've got the stuff every single day that you're doing, it is your life. Like it's everything about your life is the army. Whereas when you're a reservist, it's just that part-time thing on the side. I don't care how many, how much you turn up. It's the part-time. Even if you are continuous full-time sort of thing for a, for an extended period, it's still not a full-time gig, even though it's classed as it. You're still within reserve units you're most of the time. But there are some guys that go, you know, CFTS and they go across into full-time units and things like that. Then you get to experience it. And if you are living there and doing a full-time job, then you get to experience it. But as a reservist, as a whole, you just don't, you don't understand what it's actually like to live it and breathe it. But I'm not shitting on reserves at all. I absolutely love reservists. I, as I said, I started out as one, but even working with them, they just got a completely different mindset towards things compared to uh, full-timers. So as a full-time, as I said before, that is your job. That is your life. It is everything you do. So when there's times come that you have to go field, you have to do shitty jobs, go in there late, all this sort of stuff, you just don't want to do it. It's just shit you do all the time and you really don't, you don't want to do it. It's like cleaning your bloody room when you when your mom tells you to do it. No, I don't really, I really don't want to do that. <laughs> Whereas reservists are like, fuck yeah, let's go do that. I really want to do that because it's out of the ordinary for them. They want to go out field. They want to help with all this stuff. They're really keen for it. It's absolutely awesome. And yeah, a lot of people take time off their work. Some people take pay cuts 
to go into reserves and just do what they can. And it's really good to see. And it's a good thing to be a part of with just that completely different mindset towards working in the army. So yeah, it's very different mindsets, both ends. The full-timers are very qualified, know what they're doing, but yeah, a lot of the time you really don't want to be there if it's field exercises, things like that. But reservists, they might, may not be as qualified. They may not know the job as well as full-timers because they're just not doing it every single day. But they're keen to be there. They're keen to do all that sort of stuff. So they're really good to work with. And they take time out of their day. They don't have to be there. They only have to turn up every like 20 days a year, 20 nights a year, whatever it works out to be. I think it's 20 days. They only have to turn up that many days a year. But the majority of them will turn up a lot more than that to get in that little bit more experience, to get in those couple of more courses, to get in some extra field stuff. Yeah, do those odd jobs here and there because they love it. That's why they're there because they want to be there. They want that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's there's a big difference between them. And so when it comes to, when I talk about uh, being qualified and doing the jobs and full-timers in a way being better than reservists, it's not always the case. Sometimes reservists you know, shit all over full-times as well. You can get some really shitty full-timers as well. It's just that we do it every single day. So there's a bit of a difference when, you, when you're when you in on it every single day compared to just doing it every now and then. It's just the way it is. So that's, that. yeah, they're the biggest difference is the, uh, not only ability to do, do the job, but the mindset towards the job. They run very different. It's very up in the air when, they, when you're going off and doing exercise and things like that. Again, full-timers, you're told to go. Like you, you don't have a choice. You're going here. Okay, I'm going there. So when it comes to manning, knowing who's going and all that sort of thing, because they have to go. Whereas reservists are super hard to plan for things because, and you don't see this as the most of the time, you don't see this as a reservist. You see this when you're the Carter staff, like the full timers, they're organizing everything. It's so hard because people just, they, they're not turning. Some won't turn up, some won't answer their phones and even let you know if they're going and then they'll turn up for the exercise. So it's very hard to plan for things when people don't have to be there. They're just choosing to be there. Some people turn up last minute. Some people tell you they're going and then they don't turn up. So very hard to plan those sort of things. But in, in the army sense, with everything else, it's very similar. You're doing the same sort of jobs. You're still qualified the, the same like in, a, in like actual qualifications. Even when it comes to the, the BFA, yes, reservists only have to pass the BFA every 12 weeks. Uh, sorry, every 12 months, whereas full-timers have to pass it every six months. So there is a big difference. That's a big thing that I do remember as well is the, the fitness difference between reservists, just the reserve unit in general, including the full-time staff there. But yeah, the reservists and the full-timers, like the fitness to, yeah, the, just the general fitness because full-timers, you, you get time to train. You're pretty much a professional athlete. You're getting paid to train the majority of the time. Whereas reserves, they're fitting this stuff around their general job. Most of the time they don't do their own training, which they should to hold themselves up to that certain standard that you have to be at. But what you see a lot of the time is them, their BFA coming up and oh shit, I've got three months to train for this BFA and then I'll barely scrape it because a lot of the time, most like there are, there are still good, like fit guys in there obviously. But a lot of the time I do see them just scraping through and then the same sort of cycle, then they'll just go off their fitness and then try to get it in when the BFA is coming up next time. But that comes down to the staff there, making sure the people are keeping up their fitness. If they can, every Tuesday night, throw in like we used to do. We threw in, you know, first 45 minutes, I think it was, something like that. We'd squeeze in a workout for the guys and it was, I kept the guys up to a better level and they enjoyed coming in, doing a little bit of PT. Most of them, <laughs> some of them were like, what the fuck are we doing this for? But yeah, so... I've, I've probably missed a whole heap, of, a whole heap of stuff, but yeah, there, there is, in a sense, there's a big difference, but on, on the other hand, there, there isn't. It's just that full times, it's your everything. Like army is your life, um, whereas part-timers or reservists, it's just something that you do on the side. So it's it's still a, part, a big part of your life. You still get all that mateship and all that sort of thing that comes with it, but it's just not everything to do with your life on like full-timers. And also we have to move all the time as well. So that's a big thing with, with reservist units is I went away from, so I, I started as the, at that reserve unit and then I went away for, I, I don't even know how long it was, 10, 11 years, something like that, maybe more. And then I came back to that same 
reserve unit and it was all the same i could not believe it it was all the same people like exactly the same people and it was awesome because i knew everyone there but yeah it was just it just blew my mind because as a full-time you're moving every three months uh, sorry three years as well so that's a big thing that i don't like with the with full-time obviously the fact of moving every three years but also so many people are cycling through you can never get any sort of continuation of stuff. So people are always coming in and trying to change things or you don't get a good handover. So you have no idea how you're like, you're figuring out the first year or so or how shit actually works. And then you're getting posted out. Yeah. Three years isn't a long time in a unit to learn it, to get it better, just to piss off and then go and start at the next unit. Whereas reserve units, it's the same people there all the time. So they can really knuckle down and get things done properly, but also that can have a um, bad side of it because they just get stuck in their old ways as well. Now, this is how we've always do, done it, but yeah, they should be switching it up as well. Yeah, that's just a few differences just off the top of my head after spending a bit of time uh, in both, both get deployments. Obviously the full time is if you're on the, like the ready cycle and everything, you're going to be getting more more deployments but for reservists i've seen plenty of my friends take off and go do all different sorts of stuff like solomon's timor i think i'm pretty sure they even done timor over there yeah there's plenty of stuff and they do um a lot of natural disaster relief as well so working with the ses the fireys all that sort of stuff so there's a lot of work there awesome so how did you yep that's the next so next question is how did you land being a pdi and a vm okay so my job in the army was a vm so it, it is a VM if I was to jump back in. So I was fully qualified VM in the army sense. I wasn't even a CFL. They've changed the name now, but for fitness leaders, there used to be the acronym CFL, which is the combat fitness leader. Can't remember what it is now. It's some bigger acronym, but they've combined it with, with air force and all that sort of stuff as well. But there used to be the CFL and then you've got the PDIs and the PDIs are the physical training instructors. And they are, their core is to like, their job is to you know, train you and uh, physical training. And that they'll usually, most places will have a PDI to the unit, but a lot of places don't as well. So a lot of the places, the majority of places I went, didn't even have a PDI for that unit. All of my units that I went to, I was writing the programs and I was running the sessions as well, even though I wasn't, because you can run PT, if corporal and above. If you're, if you hit corporal, even Lance corporal, you can run a session and even do the program as well. So you don't have to be qualified in fitness sense, which can be really bad for some units because the people that are writing it have no idea. And they are just writing it because in ways to just try to hurt people a lot of the, a lot of the times and make them sore. But if you've got any idea with programming or anything and the, and the unit hasn't got a PDI and you are corporal, you'll most probably get the job of running those PT sessions and, and designing the program. And yeah, I legitimately, every unit that I was at, I, I would run the PT just because it was a massive passion of mine and I was doing studies out. So they knew I was qualified outside of the army, but that still doesn't qualify you inside the army because yeah, obviously army's got all their own qualifications, but yeah, I did all my studies outside and everyone knew that and they, everyone knew how much I was into fitness. And they saw how much I was into fitness when it came to PT and the level of my fitness that I always held it to and how much I helped everyone else through it. So I just ended up running and writing the programs a lot of the time. And it worked out really well for me because we always did what I wanted to do. <laughs> so it was awesome. But everyone just saw how well I could do it and how much it actually helped everyone out rather than them just trying to figure out their, the stuff themselves or someone doing it that had absolutely no idea whatsoever. Yeah, that's how I did it. It's just a matter of me having the qualified qualifications outside as well as having the passion there and everyone just knowing that I knew what I was doing. And, and we didn't have those uh, unit PTIs. And even if you do have a unit PTI, usually they'll only, the units that I went to, you didn't have them every day. You only had them like once a week. So when I was at 17 construction squadron, uh, yeah, we had a PTI once a week, maybe once a fortnight. And that was it. And the same with souls. We'd only, we'd very rarely have a PDI. I remember getting maybe a couple of sessions with a PDI, but that was about it. All the rest of it. Yeah. Sort yourself out, get someone to make it. So that's how all that came about. Awesome. Now next. So your top funny story from being an NCO. 
So these aren't so much from being an NCO. So NCO is a non-commissioned officer, so that's corporal and all that sort of stuff. So these are from when I was a digger and all that sort of thing as well. So the, the funniest thing and the most embarrassing thing for me, and I, I was, went over this story in my last live, is the whole square getting to go up and get my bronze commendation. <laughs> that was funny and um, very embarrassing all in one. And I look at it, back at it and I either cry about it or I laugh about it. So I'd, I'd rather laugh about it. So I see it as a funny thing. <laughs> All right. So that was, that's one of the, the first things that popped into my head. Another thing. So I don't just have the wine, like there's so many, and I'm sure if I went through and spoke to people about my units and, and what I've done through, I've you know, done the full story sort of thing, things that pop up all the time and just make me remember those times, but just off the top of my head, just trying to think of a few things. So back in trade school, you, you'd get up to so much mischief. So trade school is where you go as a VM and you'd go there to pretty much do TAFE for, it all depended, it was it was uh, own pace, so you could get through a little bit quicker if you knuckled down. If you had any brains about yeah, you could get it done a little bit quicker around about the 12 month mark, but the course was set out to be done in, within um, you know, a year and a half. So all these young guys down at trade school, pretty much living on base, like everyone is living on base, the majority of people as well, unless, they had families or anything like that, but the majority of people are living on base. It's pretty much a, a uni. So everyone's living there, everyone's working together, drinking together. So it's just mayhem. So many things happen down at trade school. And it's that, I, just one of the best times of my life down there. And I'm sure everyone feels exactly the same when they go down to that place. But yeah, one of the like, couple of funny things happened while I was down there. So you're always doing things to your mates, always trying to stuff them up in, in one way or another. If we go out drinking and you leave your room unlocked, something's going to happen to it. And we did that plenty of times. So you'd go into people's rooms, you check if their rooms are unlocked, if they've gone out or whatever. And a couple of times, just, just some of the things that had happened, we'd go in and we'd completely turn everything in their room upside down. Absolutely everything, their bed, their books, their everything in their room. And they'd come back and obviously everything's upside down. Another one that we did, we put everything that this guy owned. So we were living on base. This wasn't down at trade school, actually. This was in, in Holsworthy. I was on OJT, so on the job training at the time. So it was still very similar. And one of the guys left his room, <laughs> room unlocked and we went and took. So it was like our new single leap accommodation. So yeah, it was pretty much like a one bedroom apartment. You had your room there with a bed and you had an ensuite in there as well, which was absolutely awesome. You had a uh, balcony and everything too. So anyway, one of the guys left his, left his room unlocked or we broke in one or the other and we grabbed everything that he owned and <laughs> put it in the shower in the ensuite. Absolutely everything, including his, we couldn't get the bed in there, but we took his mattress and that was on top of the, on top of the showers, everything that he owned, stuffed it into the, into the ensuite. So that when he come back, he had nothing in his room whatsoever, opened up his ensuite and <laughs> there it all was, including his, including his mattress on top of his shower. So just always stuffing around. You know, I've heard of guys leaving their room unlocked when they go off to, off to leave, which is usually a couple of weeks mid-year and then four or so weeks at the end of the year. And people <laughs> have gone in and sprinkled grass seeds on their carpet and watered it in <laughs> so that when they get back, <laughs> there's all this grass <laughs> growing in that carpet uh it's funny lots and lots of stuff that people get very creative with this sort of stuff so uh, really good to to be a part of that sort of thing and you really got to watch your back other things are again down at trade school just on the piss you know, a lot of the stuff happened when you when we we're on the piss and one big night we had one night was we went out and we would have been back early hours in the morning one two o'clock whatever it was and we're all wrestling as all the guys do. And somehow one of us, probably me, ended up getting one of the fire hoses out, one of the big real fire hoses and started hosing everyone down. And my mates ran into the room and I'm still hosing him down all through the common rooms and through my room and everything. He was absolutely soaked. Walked out, had enough of that. And one of the other guys grabbed a fire extinguisher off the wall and he shot me with one of the, it was like a, the powder ones. And he shot me with the bung out of the end. So he squeezed and it shot the bung out of it. 
and it hit me and I was like, oh, you bastard. He dropped the, the fire extinguisher and he took off and he ran up you know, like our building stairs. So I've chased him and there was no way I was going to catch him. So I sat at the bottom, not really having any idea because I hadn't set off too many fire extinguishers before, not really having too much of an idea of the effect that this would have. And I stood at the bottom of the stairs as he's running up these spiral stairs. And I just started squeezing this dry cam fire extinguisher and it just filled the place, just started going absolutely everywhere. And uh, there was that much of it, just this big cloud of it. But now the fire alarms are going off. So I've dropped the thing. I took off, ran in the bushes. The duty staff come down. The fire engine turned up because all the fire alarms and everything were going off and they couldn't turn them off. And my mates come down with all those people there and he's just drenched because he's been hit with a fire hose as well. They all thought he'd done it. But here I am lying in the bushes away from everything. I can just see the fire engine in the distance. I'm just sitting there waiting for everyone to leave and then (laughs) I've come back. But yeah, the next day, as soon as we turned up, actually, no, it was in the afternoon. We're getting knocked off and the ASM or whoever it was, the wing SM, sorry, the wing SM down at the trade school before we knocked off, he's pulled everyone in and he's like, none of you are leaving until someone owns up that set off that fire extinguisher. And I just stood up and I'm like, you could have just asked, <laughs> said it was me. And he's like, oh, righto. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that happened from that is I had to pay for the fire extinguisher the, to get refilled, which I ended up making the guy that shot me with the bung. I didn't make it, but he offered to pay half of it for me because it was a good couple hundred bucks and he paid half of it for me and then off we went. That was all that happened. Yeah, so I got to soak my mates with a fire hose, set all the alarms off with a fire extinguisher and all the fire, the fireys came, the duty staff and everyone. And uh, yeah, just had to pay for the fire extinguisher. So that was a fun night, but that stuff like that always happens down there. I don't know how crazy it is now. That was a, that's a tame night down there. And uh, yeah, there's definitely been some bigger days and nights that I could probably share at, a, at another time. So what else did I have? Oh, mate, as I said, there's so many things. So this was when I was a corporal, but it's got nothing to do with it being a corporal. But it was up when I was playing enemy. So we went up, I think it was called Op- Operation Parapet. I can't really remember. It's on my PM keys, but it was pretty much to support the G20. This was when I was with supporting special forces. And we went up for the big G20 that we had back in, I think it was like 2000. It was either 2000, it must've been 2016 or around about then. And that was up in Brisbane and everyone, big head honchos and everything there for the big G20 meetup. And obviously we had Tag East there taking care of the place and, and all and on call and all that sort of stuff. So what we had to do a lot of, so we were just there supporting. So we you know, had to just support, make sure we were there to help them do whatever they need to do, drive them around, get everything ready for them, all that sort of thing. But one of the other jobs we were doing there was we were playing enemy and it's absolutely awesome playing enemy for two commando. Like I've done it many times in many different scenarios, but we did two, two in particular. They actually did three, but I was a part of two while we were there. And both of them has, has some pretty funny things. So the very first one that we did, I think this was the first one. And we were in this fancy hotel, it was like a big Hilton hotel or whatever. And what you do when you play enemy, you're pretty much, you're playing enemy. Everyone's got like paint sim guns. So it's not paintball, it's paint sim. So it's a real sort of rifle or gun, whatever you got set up with, with paint sims. And they come in and storm the place and, and you're pretty much playing enemy or, or hostage. And yeah, you just, you got to go about it and play the scenario. So my little job was to be out on the wharf. And when they came in and they stormed one of the ferries out there, I had to shoot them from the the wharf and make them chase me until I got shot pretty much. So (laughs) when we turn, so you got to get all dressed up as well. You're in these overalls. I've got a, what was it? mp5 so it's like a shotgun looking thing i'd never fired them before like in in real live shoots or anything but had the paint set up for it and yeah it's pretty much it looks like uh, from memory it looks like a little shotgun but carrying this thing around like you're in civilian world as well but it's stupid o'clock like three four four o'clock in the morning whatever it is so no one's up and uh, yeah you're in overalls so you pretty much look like a terrorist 
So they're off, like they came in and they stormed the ferry and I'm just hiding away on the side and I start shooting them and my friggin' gun kept jamming up because the paint jams them up sometimes. And I had a really good shot on them and I just couldn't shoot them because the freaking thing wasn't working properly. So they've come blasting out. So I've legged it and I'm running. And then we had areas we had to stay within as well. So I hit around the corner. And as they come around the corner, I'm trying to shoot them, but my freaking gun wasn't working. So I just got pumped with all these pellets. And I just had to lay there and wait for and wait for the scenario to be over. And what happens is when the scenario is over, they'll call everyone in and they'll debrief. Everyone talks about it, see what they did right, wrong, all this sort of stuff and try to get improvements. But you pretty much lay there until the scenario is over and you don't know it's over until someone comes up and, and tells you it's over. So I'm laying there and I, I felt like I was laying there for ages. Eventually someone came across and they're like, what are you still doing here? I'm like, I'm waiting for someone to tell me. And they're like, oh yeah, no worries. We'll just wait there and we'll go in and we'll let them know that you're out here. So they'd forgotten about me to start with. And then he's gone inside. And I'm like, yeah, sweet. At least someone's in there telling them and I'll, I'll get someone out here soon. And I'm waiting. And you don't want to move because if you leave and they think you're there and then you're not there and you just don't want to go. So I'm sitting there and waiting and waiting and just fuck this. Oh, there, there's no way this is still going. Like this is done. Anyway, as I started, what I'm like, no, nah, I got to go um, because otherwise I'm going to get left because you catch a bus in there. As I leave, I'm walking out and the bus is packed. Everyone's on it. So we're in this little mini bus. Everyone's on it and it's just about to drive off. If I was 30 seconds later, I would have been left walking around the main streets in, in Brisbane with this shotgun looking thing <laughs> and overalls with no way to hide. If I had to hide, because you couldn't just leave the gun there or stash it somewhere, I would have had to walk around and try to find, I didn't have phone. I didn't have nothing on me. And I would have had to walk around Brisbane. This is within a 30 second window if I missed it. I would have had to walk around Brisbane either stuffing a freaking shotgun looking thing down into my overalls and going to trying to find some people to try to get me back to base or just walk around freaking waving this thing around. Like I would have been stuffed, but I'd always think back at that. Like that 30 seconds saved me so much hassle. I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> it would have been a messy night because it was like three, four, five o'clock, whatever it was in the morning as well. So it was it would have been a crazy night if yeah, if I was just that little bit later. But then there was another scenario as well. We blocked off some of the tunnels in in Brisbane, some of the main tunnels there, and we had bushies up there. We had banged up cars, and they're throwing like smoke, throwing flashbangs and all sorts of things through in there. And it was absolutely awesome. And one of the scenarios. We were sitting in like a, it was supposed to be a broken down, no, just a, a terrorist car. And we were sitting in there. I had two of the guys in the front and I was sitting in the back. And it just really surprised me how well they did this. We're sitting there talking and we knew everything that was going. Like we knew it was happening. We knew people were coming. We were keeping an eye out in the mirrors and all sorts of things. And we're sitting there and we're like, Jesus. I feel like they're going to be coming soon, but I can't see them. This is a tunnel. You're thinking I'm easily going to see them coming either direction. Even if there are cars and stuff there, we're still going to see them. Anyway, we're like, we better pull our mask down just in case something goes on. And it was like, as soon as the two guys in the front, because they got their windows down as well, which is probably another mistake. As soon as the guys pulled their mask down, they just got lit up and it was like the guys were getting electrocuted on those front seats, just getting peppered with all these phone sims. I had my hand on the door handle. I wouldn't let go of it the whole time we were there because I knew we'd get surprised. And as soon as I saw those guys getting electrocuted on the seats, I opened the door and just launched out. I've landed on my back and then I've got out and I'm trying to shoot them. But what had happened and they eventually got me real easy. Like I was trying to shoot this guy here and a guy got me there like piece of piss. But what had happened is there was a, like a, a, an emergency exit door pretty much right next to us. And we had no idea it was there. Even though we, we knew what was going on, we're looking for places that they can come in. We had no idea about this door. And he's just opened up the door, straight line, like straight shot, straight into the front windows. 
and got these two guys and then eventually got me like really easily afterwards as well. And it was a big eye opener of how well they can, they can actually do that stuff. And it was funny as hell watching the two guys just pull their mask down and then just start getting electrocuted on those front seats. It was good. So yeah, man, Anthony, I got loads and loads of funny stories. And like I said, if I went through and started going unit by unit, I'm sure lots and lots of stuff would pop up. And it always does when I'm out. And I'd be like, oh, this one time and this happened, blah, blah, blah. Even thinking about it now, I can still think of other things that, that it'd be good to say, but maybe we'll leave it for another time. Okay, next question is from Ben. So he's got two of them. What was your favorite thing about uh, the work you did? I think I went over a fair few of the <laughs> things that I enjoyed with those funny stories, like all of that sort of stuff. Where are you ever going to get that? Nowhere. Like it's it, that sort of stuff was what I was looking for to when I joined the army. And it's what I got. I got to do paratrooping as well, which is a rare thing, especially as a mechanic to be able to do only because I was attached to special forces and got to do all of that. And my hierarchy were really good getting me on that course as well. So to get your wings as a mechanic, to get your wings in general, there's one unit. No, in the army, there's one unit that does it. And that's two commando and the surrounding units that are in there. So to get that is, is absolutely awesome. Obviously there's a few uh, jobs and stuff in the RAF and yeah, maybe, maybe six av get out there as well. Maybe they can get their wings as well, but I'm sure there's other little areas, but yeah, in the army, there's generally one, one place that you can get them. Now it used to be three RER. Those guys used to be the paratroopers, but they lost their wings. And yeah, so to get that is, is absolutely awesome that you'll never, ever be able to do anywhere else. And you're jumping out at the one that I did was static line as well. So you're jumping out at 300 meters and there's it's six seconds before you actually hit the ground. You can see the ground really. It's not like when you're doing tandem at 10, 12,000 feet and you got some free fall and all that sort of stuff. They, they do that as well. That's the next level up. But static line, you're just attached. Your pack is attached to a line that's attached to a line <laughs> attached to the plane. So when you jump out, your parachute's getting pulled for you and there's so much that can go wrong and you're so close to the ground. Like the, the, uh, the massive planes that you go in, they have to go that slow that they're, they're like dipping down and it's really crazy to see. But yeah, stuff like that, being able to, being a paid athlete pretty much, like I absolutely love that. It was one of the best things that I found with the army and it was one of the, the biggest things that attracted me to the army as well is, is to get paid to train and have a reason to have such a high level of fitness. And that's really what I was chasing a lot of the time. Like I grew up doing sports and I always chased the reason to be at a high level. And I felt like I needed to be used because I was like, I'd held, hold myself that high. I, I felt like I needed to use it for something. And that was a big driver for me with that. Just the overall skills, not just mechanic side of things, but overall soldier skills, like the general military skills with nav, getting the experience of just sleeping out on the rocks <laughs> and digging pits, which you, know, you absolutely hate when you're doing it, but you look back at it and no, those are the sort of things when you're bonding with people, you just, it's pissing down rain or uh, there's different scenarios with digging pits, pissing down rain and just taking a scoop and it's just getting filled back in and you just, uh, like, it's just not creating a hole or the opposite. It's stinking hot and you're chipping into rocks and you're just not going anywhere. They always choose the worst places and the worst times to do it. All those sort of things, traveling around, doing different things. So I only went overseas once. I went to Philippines once for a small little operation, but all the rest of my stuff I did throughout Australia. And I did a few different things and lots of different exercises. So I did, I think it's, I'm pretty sure I did three three yeah i did three ops within australia and i did plenty of exercises and then also plenty of stuff that weren't classed as exercise or operations as well and you're going places to to do all that sort of stuff like at, at, at souls we were on two hours notice to move at times so you had to be in ready to go within in the unit within two hours with all your gear there loads of experiences loads of skills when you're going up in the ranks as you're going through from a digger to a lance corporal to a corporal to sergeant you're just learning all of these skills that 
really help with your overall life. And when you move it, like when you go outside of the army, it's so many, so much of that stuff just helps as well as the grit that it creates, like it helps you create within yourself to this shit's hard. As an example, I was doing a business course. It was about a month ago. Now I, I took three days off when I told you guys that I was having those three days off and I did a bit of a business course. And one of the days we went from seven o'clock in the morning and then we finished all the lectures and everything at it would have been seven, eight o'clock at night. And then we had to create all of this content and things by the next morning at a, and to start at eight o'clock. I was up till three o'clock, 3 a.m. in the morning, sitting behind my computer, nonstop doing all of that. And all I was thinking when I was doing it, I was just like, I've done this plenty of times. Like it was, it felt like nothing. Like I, I was just like, this is getting done tonight. And there's, there's no if, buts or maybes. It, it was getting done. And I was like, I was going to stay up the whole night if it didn't get done. And so, yeah, so times like that, you just fall back on that, the stuff that you've done, the, all the shitty field exercise that you've done, all those shitty <laughs> subject courses and everything like that. It's, it, it really does help you out. But yeah, skills, experience, mateship, like the, the friendships and the, the bonds that you make within the army is just ridiculous because you're taken away from the norm and you're putting put in all of those types of scenarios as well. It, it Yeah, it just creates something that you'll never get anywhere else. But it's there's just nothing like it. Like this, yeah, and it was everything that I expected. A lot of the, you'll get in there as well and there'll be shit times. There'll be times where you just say, this is crap. This is not what I was expecting to do when I joined the army or whatever it is that you're joining. It's, you know, or you got shit bosses, you got sh you're at a shit unit. All that stuff comes with no matter what you do. But when you leave, I'm telling you, that's not the stuff you'll be thinking of. You'll be thinking all the cool stuff. And even the shit stuff that you did, you'll remember that stuff. And you'll be like, oh, remember that time I, uh, we did that, like that real shit thing, you know, dug pits or stayed up all night filling sandbags and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, they're the real memories that, that you will remember and tell people about. Even though it's really shit at the time when you're doing that sort of stuff. But yeah. No, there's just nothing like it. That's as simple as that. Um, and I got a trade out of it as well. So I got mechanic side of things. I'll probably never use that again. And I was a pretty shit mechanic, even though they do really good training and everything as well. Mechanicing was just never my forte. I was all right at it. I knew what I was doing. But yeah, I was always the fitness side of things. It's just, that was just always my passion, even when I was in as a mechanic. Still did the job as I needed to, but it's not really what I wanted to be doing. Your second thing was what did an average day consist of for you as a mechanic in the army? Man, this was, it's completely like up in the air with what's going on with the unit because the units go through cycles of what you do in different years. Like sometimes uh, they, they're probably still got the old force gen cycle where there's three stages. You'll be readying. So getting ready to deploy, you'll be ready. And that's when you're actually going over, you've got all your exercise and everything like that going on. And then you've got reset. And that's when you go, when your units, you got the opportunity to go off and do all your courses and just, yeah, recoup and all that sort of stuff. So all depending on where your unit it is, depends on what you're going to be doing. Like when you're going, when you're in readying, you're going to be doing a lot of exercises. It all depends on the unit that you go to as well. So as a mechanic, we could do, go to any unit. If you go to a cab, you're just outfield all the time. If you go to uh, a construction unit, you go outfield every now and then. And even when you do, it's as a white force, sorry, as a white force. But yeah, there's many uh, like different types of units. Uh, but as a general day, as a mechanic, you'd rock up. So you'd start work, what, 7.30? You do PT up till 8.30. You'd have, this is typical, just general, most unit sort of battle rhythm sort of thing. So you'll do, uh, start at 7.30. Uh, Again, even start time can completely change. If you don't want to pack March or whatever, and you're in a hot environment, you'll be starting at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. But as a typical day, if everything just fell in line and you're just doing a absolute normal day. Yeah. So you'd do, you'd start at 7.30, you'd finish PT at 8.30. PT could be a range of different stuff. Then you'd have half hour for smoko. Half hour, some places even gave you an hour. Or actually, you'd have half hour to have a shower. 
and then and then smoke goes so around about an hour so you'd pretty much be starting work nine depending sometimes nine thirty and then you'd work as a mechanic or depending on what you were within the workshop sometimes you'd be down on the floor if you were mainly a digger or a floor corporal if you were a, a manager or you'd plan as a planner or anything like that you'd be up in the office doing all your planning on the computers um so then you'd work up till 12 30 have lunch for an hour go back to work and that's yeah you'd knock off at 4 30 you'd have some units that have knock off most units will have knock off parades actually yeah nearly all of them knock off parade at 4 15 or whatever and uh, yeah then you're off and that's just a typical day but there's so many things that will throw that schedule out of whack even when you are at the unit there's so many things within that within the unit that you can be doing as well you can be stabbed to go off and inspect weapons go and count shit for the q store you could be going off and doing uh shooting practice you can do like so many different things you can do mini courses within your unit so yeah it, it all depends it's really hard to say a typical day but in general if nothing else absolutely nothing what else was on yeah that's just how the day would roll with pt and just work lunch knock off and and that'd be it but yeah in the army you get paid a wage as well so it, it does like you don't have a start time or a finish time like you can work as long as you want as long as they want you to in a day and you're still getting paid the same the only time you'll get allowances and things is if you go away and you got incidentals or you got or you got field allowance and things like that and even you have to be out field for a certain amount of time yeah you can work 24 hours or you can work fucking three hours and they'll pay you, pay you the same so yeah all right that's it i'll check if there's any more questions here from you guys that you want me to go over harry these are some bloody epic stories good glad glad you're enjoying them so i'll just give you a couple of moments i can see there's a couple of people on there so if you've got any questions or anything else that you want me to go over while we're here feel free to just cut, chuck them in the comment section and i'll go over it right now if not yeah if you are watching this and you see some and you have some questions or anything like that feel free chuck them in the comment section and, and i'll answer them for you once i get the notification all right guys that looks like it's about it <clears throat> i've been talking non-stop for the last nearly 50 minutes <laughs> yeah hopefully you've enjoyed it a few insights into what the army is like and through my my experience through my career and i'll tell you what i could be talking all day on it and still not even scrape the surface even though like i said i didn't do any massive deployments overseas or anything like that but i did a lot i spent 16 years in so only about or i'd probably be two two years of that was a reserve around about I, I really don't know i'd have to have a look at my look at my stuff and the rest of it was full time so i lived and breathed it for a very long time and as i said before it is your life when you're in it, it's your whole life like it's your family's life you talk army when you get home like it, it is honestly like learning a different language as well if you're single when you join and then you get a girlfriend or partner whoever it is that comes home and you've got a couple of army mates there and you're talking they have no idea what you're talking about using all the acronyms and everything until they hang around you a little bit more and they start to learn it and it's a funny thing remember i've told you this because you'll see it a lot it's uh it's pretty funny because so many times my partner would just be like i have no idea what the fuck you're talking about abg this and pqr that and <laughs> it's funny but they learn it's yeah they just need to ask questions all right guys that's it enjoy the rest of your week i'll see you all next week